Hello, everyone. Um, I thought I'd get started by giving both of the founders here a chance to explain what they're building. So, Francesco, one minute. Explain what, what you're building with your Fusion device. It's very easy to describe, of course. You get a feeling here for what Wenderstein 7 x or W7X for short, is. This is a Stellarator in the north of Germany. Um, it's a complicated device that was funded with more than 1.5 billion uh, of public investment. You break it down, it's an ecosystem of technology with magnets holding hot ionized matter at millions of degrees, with lots of structures, lots of cabling here. All of this has been a scientific experiment until now. Proxima Fusion was founded about 18 months ago, and we are scaling this to what is now a concept for a power plant. We are created as a company, as an engineering company, to take stellarators and really show that this is the path for clean energy. Great. Elizabeth, one minute. Explain the future of nuclear fission with your company, Nucleo. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, Nucleo is a young company built uh, three years ago, and the aim is to produce energy, nuclear energy, safe, clean, and sustainable energy. This is, it, is based on a, it is based on a Generation 4 reactor, mm? so the very, very innovative uh, technology of reactor, compact, uh, we will discuss about this. And uh, what, what makes unique our model is that our fuel is based on the recycling of nuclear waste produced by the current nuclear industry. Got it. Thank you so much. So I guess I'll open up by fusion's a big dream, fission's a big dream to reignite. When we think about the next kind of the next few years in the 2020s and then the 2030s, what do you plan to build in the 2020s, and what does that allow you to deliver to the world in the 2030s? Well, uh, the first reactor will be operated uh, with our fuel, so we start with sustainable, sustainable fuel, in 2031. We have several milestones in, in, in before this, uh, this uh, reach, well, this objective. It is 2026. In 2026, we'll have our first uh, prototype, non-nuclear prototype, so filled with electricity, just to, to, uh, to be sure that all the components will really work together. And uh, uh, in 2030, we will have our first MOX factory. The MOX factory, it is the factory able to re Pro recycle the current nuclear waste. We have a lot of nuclear waste uh, throughout Europe, uh, and we calculate that the only the, the, the waste we have in Europe is enough for the need of energy of the next 1,000 years for all the Europe. Just using re recycled fuel? Just using recycled. So no mining anymore, no mining, but above all, reduce the nuclear waste, which represents for all the governments of nuclear countries a liability. And a lot of money is spent to maintain these geological deposits and to avoid proliferation, to protect this. So our promise is to reduce, even eliminate throughout the years, the, uh, this, uh, this waste. And if you succeed at doing all of that, by 2040, what will be the sort of total energy generation capacity that Nucleo could be putting into European grids? So, um, the, starting from 2033, we will be able to build as many reactors, as many partners we will have, because our objective is not only to operate reactors, but to work with and so establish JV, uh, estab um, creating uh, the, the opportunity with a partner, usually energy company, that can, with endorsement of the local governments, uh, can, uh, we, we can together use our reactors uh, and we can produce the fuel we need, uh, recycling it in our MAX factory base in France. Got it. And Francesco, for you, what do you, what do you aim to do in the rest of the 2020s and what does that set you up to do by 2040? Mm -hmm. So maybe, first of all, it's, it's worth distinguishing the technologies for a second. So Elizabeth is talking about fission, uh, whereas Proxima works on fusion. So fusion is the process that happens at the center of the stars. We're not at the same level of technology readiness level. We are aiming in 2031 to demonstrate for the first time net energy production in steady state. 
So that's a stage, a fundamental level beyond which then increasing, making the device larger with the exact same technology. We think that would be a first of a kind fusion power plant within the 2030s. To get to 2031 and have a net energy device, the critical milestone is in 2027 building a, non a, a weirdly shaped, twisty, high temperature superconducting magnet. So as a company, we're working on some of the most advanced magnets that humanity's, humanity has ever seen. And hopefully 2031 is the time when we show the integrated system after W7X. And then by 2040, where do we, if things go as well as you hope, what does what is, what is the energy generation capacity of a company like Proxima look like? Yeah, so I tend to think of it a bit the other way around. Um, as a mission, we have to be relevant to the decarbonization of the energy system by 2050. If you want to actually be relevant, you need to think about the terawatt kind of scale. A terawatt is a lot of energy. It means 1,000 gigawatts. If we're talking about gigawatt scale power plants, that means by 2050, you need to get to the capacity of making thousands of these systems. If you want to see that happening over the 2040s, you need to see a curve, the likes of fission in the, in the 1980s, something fantastic that France did back then. To get that done, within the 2030s, we need to be able to get a first-of-a-kind fusion power plant that shows commercial viability, all the features. So going backwards, first one within the 2030s, and then parallelization scale up over the 2040s. One thing that is very apparent when you survey the nuclear landscape is quite how much Europe has contributed in terms of fundamental research and actually commercialization, you know, the way that France has led the world in, in fission reactors. Um, but historically, there is a story of Europe inventing amazing things, like DeepMind inventing a lot of significant things in AI or Skype inventing a lot of things in social networking, but then these technologies being scaled up in the US or elsewhere or in China. Mm -hmm. um, can you sort of give me a sense of what you think needs to happen for us to win the race to next generation fission reactors or first of a kind fusion devices? What does Europe need to do to win here? Okay, I can start, yeah. Um, First of all, I think that we need to work on the acceptability of nuclear because there was a very bad narrative in the last 20, 30 years and this is contributed to the stop of the growth of this, uh, uh, of this sector which is extremely important for the future. Now the sensitivity there is on uh, climate change and above all on energy independence uh, uh, are two main factors that uh, make today more uh, what well, make today possible the growth of uh, of nuclear. And is that what sort of saying Europeans need to get excited about nuclear? Yeah, it depends on the countries, but we are working at European level, and recently. A um, alliance has been established uh, in, in Bruxelles, so a SMR European alliance, uh, just to create the framework from a regulatory point of view and from a, a legislative uh, point of view in order to accelerate, because today the reason why we're not ready tomorrow morning to have a, a reactor, operating a reactor, it is because we need to go under a licensing process. We are already in under the licensing process we started two years ago, one and a half years ago, and um, the licensing may aim to check all the possible security and safety of this solution. And of course, if we do this at European level, we will not pass through a licensing process in every single one. So I think that Europe can play a significant role in the world, aiming at the independence of energy and absolutely through the nuclear. And there is another thing, I'm very happy to be with Francesca today because uh, there are also sometimes bad narratives. There is fission, there is a fusion. Well, the fusion is the dream of every nuclear physicist. So there is not a battle between one and the other, like there is not a battle with renewable or, or fission. Renewable as that doesn't guarantee the base load, but if you couple the, the renewable with, um, with a reactor that can stock 
uh, heating. Why it doesn't work? Because the renewable is working. And when the renewable stops working, the reactor can provide the energy to stabilize the production of energy. Mm -hmm. And fusion is just the future. And of course it will be the future, but in the meantime, we need to leverage science. And the technology we are proposing is based on 30, even 40 years of research. So yeah. we are ready. Yeah. And Francesco, if you, mm -hmm. what, do you, what needs to change in, in, what needs to happen in, for us to win in Europe for fusion? Because this yeah. is in some ways a much more open race, because there is no winner, like there is nothing yet. Right. So I agree with everything Elizabeth just said. Um, the regulation, of course, is important. Um, in fusion, fusion doesn't have a chain reaction, so it's, it's as a different, the, the licensing we're expecting to be simpler. But more directly to your question, I think the main thing is we have to step up the game in Europe in execution, quality of execution, attracting the people that have been looking in the US for the greatest challenges in technology. We need to show them that they can stay in Europe, that we can finance this kind of work. But to some extent, it's a cultural change, I think, that we are looking for to accelerate. Uh, counting less on, uh, you know, energy is always led by governments. Energy policy is made by governments. At the same time, we shouldn't just wait for governments to hand over to us the opportunity to really change this technology landscape. So finding the radicals, telling them, look, this thing makes sense. As Elizabeth was saying, it's plainly logical. We need fission right now for the foreseeable future. And fusion, we need to accelerate and try to deliver it on time. As on budget, as, um, as soon as possible. We need to find the right people to deliver with that level of ambition. One thing that's interesting about fusion and the sort of uh, next generation fission reactors is that in many ways, you, you're both trying to kind of pick up the baton that the sort of the government has, uh, that has kind of carried until now. Certainly in fusion, it's been mostly government funded. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me a lot of the dynamics of, of, of um, of both AI research, which was primarily led by state-backed entities in academia, and then it flipped the private sector hard. The same is true of space, right? Led by the public sector, flipped the private sector hard with companies like SpaceX. What is the like, what is, the, is that what it feels like building right now, that you're in, in, in the process of a handover between the public sector and the private sector? Well, uh, this is a very interesting question because uh, I consider that nuclear is now, with a generation four, for the first time able to attract private sector. Yeah. As we demonstrated, we, uh, we just raised uh, in three years 537 million euro, and most of these uh, funds are private funds because there, is, there were not uh, government funds, public funds, not, not yet, not at this time. So uh, this, well, it gave us a, a strong responsibility because this is, uh, of course, the result of a strong sensitivity there is on climate change, on the credibility, of course, of the, the co-founder, now we're three, three of us, and the uh, solidity of the project. But to become, to reach our, uh, our aim, we need, to, to, we need to, um, to raise the three billion, so two and a half billion more. Uh, of course, it is nothing compared with the big nuclear plant, but we need the support of the public. Because not only for the support from an economic point of view, but also for the credibility that this will give to our project to attract new, new private sector. So we consider that this is, there is a shift of paradigm in nuclear sector, while finally public and, um, and private sector can work, and private investment can work together to make this real. Yeah. This is not by chance that we recently uh, launched our subsidiary in Bruxelles because it is the place where I, this morning, I wake up in, uh, in, uh, in Bruxelles uh, just because it is important to be close to the institution that can create this framework of financing, incentivize, incentivize also for the, uh, the private investor and of course to, um, to draft the project to, for public yeah. funds. What about you, Francesco? Does it feel like a baton is being passed? I think fusion, as you said, has been completely led by public research so far. So we're very much in, the, in that transition phase. Public-private partnerships are not just a nice thing for us. They are the necessity. We span out from the Max Planck Society, the 
national physical laboratories of Germany, and we build on those kind of partnerships, also funded by the government to collaborate with those labs, do know-how transfer, and bring what we can, which a national lab does not easily access, which is speed, best-in-class engineers, um, ability to adapt to conditions. But there is a lot to say about the value of taking also the credibility, um, the scientific reputation of working with institutions that have been doing research on certain topics for decades, but now changing the way we work, bringing a very different attitude of urgency, to be honest. Yeah? That's the one thing that it's not so easy to, to find in a national lab. And yet, if we are serious about those timescales and those ambitions of getting to terawatts, we really need a startup culture. Yeah. So public funding, yes. Um, working in public-private partnership on the scientific side, but the engineering needs to be led by the private companies. And, and are there any, like, you know, people have been dreaming about, um, people have been dreaming about companies like yours succeeding for a long time, right? Is there anything that's changed, and I don't mean geopolitically or, uh, you know, regulatorily, but just from a technology point of view, is there anything that's changed that makes what you're doing easier today? Uh, I, I, I think that what makes this, uh, um, well, nothing really changed. What really changed is that is the need. Climate change yeah. became a so, priority. So, so this was. climate. So, as I said earlier, the research on fission, I used to work on this project of 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, in, the, in the meantime, the research optimized the project. But now, the technology is ready. Of course, we, we, we could work, uh, and we will work, to make our reactor even more efficient. Yeah. Even more efficient, and to optimize uh, the size of the reactor. The reactors are very small, 6 meter by 6 meter, and they can be able to, 200 megawatt, mm -hmm. are able to uh, cover the energy needs for a um, city of 600,000 people. So it's really a small, a small reactor. Of course, we can work in optimizing, in uh, increasing temperature, and so make our reactor even more efficient. Mm. But the technology is ready. It's fundamentally been there for is a fundamentally. So we were just waiting for the moment yeah. uh, to start this, uh, this, uh, this adventure. And unfortunately, the uh, war uh, between Ukraine and Russia unfortunately, accelerate the yeah. need, because not only the climate change, but above all, the energy independence made, well, became an absolute priority. Yeah. What about you, Francesco? In fusion, it's, it's very different. <laughs> We're yeah, of course. In a very different it is, phase it of, is. of the development. Fission has been an established technology to a large extent, and it's yeah, it's a lot changing of the, the processes. Fusion really has there is now an explosion of activity of interest also on the investment side because the basic technology is evolving. So for us, high temperature superconductors, so new materials are now industrialized and our challenge is to integrate them into a single magnet and make much more powerful magnets that can operate in very different conditions. That's really the enabler to stellarators, to go from the demonstration of W7X, which only really was completed in 2022, then in 2022 there was also a publication that came out and showed yeah. that now we can optimize numerically these devices, these twisty shapes of this magnetic cage. So in 2022, everything changed for us, and that was the year that we came yeah. together from the Max Planck from MIT and Google X, and we said, if not now, when? Um, and we had to adapt and say, okay, we thought we were going to do these other things in life, and yet, now is the moment. Mm. One, one thing I'm curious about, because there will be some investors in the audience, is, is kind of, what gets investors to flip from, I think a lot of investors here will think of fusion and fission as kind of like too crazy, you know? Um, they'll, they'll sort of be thinking, well, I, I, how do I basically make sure that like, I'm not doing too much of this kind of thing, I should put my focus on things like FinTech, B2B SaaS, stuff that establish fields of technology investing. And I've had this experience of a couple of times now investing in companies before, um, before the venture community wanted to, to kind of take that risk. So a good example is I was in the seed round of Anthropic as an investor, and it was a hundred million round, and there were no venture investors in the round. It was a bunch of sort of 
esoteric investors who just believed in AI's promise in 2021. And then by 2023, you know, every VC has a market map of every single AI thing they want to now invest in, right? And the same was true of defense tech. In 2020, I was in the pre-seed of, uh, of Helsing, and it was a very unpopular category. They raised 100 million without really ever talking to conventional investors. And now, again, every investor has their sort of defense tech thesis market map or the rest of it. So what do you think is going to be the trigger for your sector to suddenly flip from crazy outsider deep tech to much more conventional? Well, I consider that, well, even if I'm a nuclear physicist, I spend most of my professional life in finance, so I can completely understand the mindset of, uh, of investor and their different strategy they have. Of course, it's a question of risk. So, uh, investing in an early stage company, it is, of course, much risky, but it is also much promising, especially if you strongly believe that nuclear is future. More and more investors are considering nuclear the future. And so more and more investors are very attracted by this sector because they understand that we need it. There is an irreversible process. We will never go back. So they understand the only, the only choice they have to do is to understand where, we are, where are the best players. And in, uh, look at the US market, for instance, we see as a completely different approach. For them, as an elapsed time of investment of 15 or 20 years, it's just normal. Yeah. In, the, in Europe, they are much conservative and sometimes they prefer to stay to understand where, it, where will be the commercialization phase. So we will invest when you will start to making revenues. And so, of course, this is a more conservative approach. But if you are, well, if we consider, for instance, like talk about nu uh, nuclear, but we, you can apply this uh, comment to all the other startups. Uh, uh, if you uh, consider that at the end of 2026, we will be pre-authorized by Nuclear Safety Authority to build our reactor, I think that we have strong pro probability to go public and so to, uh, to have a dream of IPO. We know that IPO is not something that we can choose. It is the circumstances, it is the rules of the market that decided for us. Mm -hmm. But we, we could be ready we, we will be ready. So this is why what we consider crazy maybe is much less crazy than we think. I'll add to that that I think a good investor recognizes the maturing of a technology. What was crazy 100 years ago suddenly wasn't crazy when somebody started making it in, in a serious production. On top of that, I think if an investor today doesn't see an elephant in the room in the fact that we're not limited by supply of energy. We're really, like, the, we are limited by supply. The demand of the AI systems that everyone else is, is now investing in, all of that stops being really making that much sense once we don't create new sources of clean energy. So whatever you invest in, our society is fundamentally limited in its ambitions, in technology investments of any sort, by the availability of clean energy. At some point, if you're missing this category of clean energy for Europe, where energy has become now a security question, you're missing the biggest wave of our lives. Yeah. One thing that I am um, talking to investors in Silicon Valley and uh, people in DC, one of the emerging consensuses around one sector that will benefit a lot from the Trump administration is basically nuclear, because you know the, the understanding and commitment of needing more energy generation for AI data centers, et cetera, well, Francesco said, but I think also just the influence that some deep tech investors have had on White House thinking. You know, someone like Elon is probably the greatest deep tech founder of, you know, the last hundred years, right? So, someone like that just fundamentally understands this stuff more deeply than a more conventional fa founder. One of the worries that I have is that U.S. nuclear will boom precisely at the time when Europe is kind of ready to boom itself. So how do you think about Europe's distinct advantages here? What are the reasons why Europe deserves to win in fusion or deserves to win in these next generation fission devices? First of all, because the competencies, most of the companies are European. When we started, we, we launched the, the nuclear company, we attracted so many, we, uh, we have today 900 people in yeah. our company, 
And most of them are, were European, uh, in, European in, nuclear engineers coming abroad. Yeah, and, neither. and does that mean that in fission, there just are more physicists and, and engineers with nuclear experience in Europe than in the US? Mm, no, I think most of them were, were, work, were working in the US or uh, abroad in the world. So, but they came, uh, came back, especially in Italy, which was a non-nuclear country, uh, where we have our reactor, the reactor research center is based in Italy. The fuel one is in France. And uh, because the companies, most of the companies of the, on the fuel are in France, most of the company and a lot of, a comp and a lot of companies on nuclear reactor generation for are uh, from Italian people. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of throughout Europe. We can make the difference because we are monitoring all the projects, the known projects uh, coming from the US, uh, from the Russia, from China is a little bit, bit more difficult, but we know that they are progressing on this. And nuclear, uh, Europe can absolutely make the difference because they have the, also from the supply chain point of view, yeah. we are identifying so many small and medium companies throughout Europe uh, that have very, very specific and essential competence uh, that will be important for the construction phase. And so we are, of course, uh, uh, making relationships and uh, sometimes acquiring them. So there's, there's a, a, a supply chain advantage and a talent advantage. And the question is, can we assemble it into an iconic company? Yes, we can. We can do that. We, we, we absolutely can do this. Of course, we need, as I said earlier, it, it is important to have the support from the government, not only from the financing regulation, but also from a, an education point of view. Mm? Because in a few years, so we will need, as Francesco said, uh, so many, so many nuclear physicists and nuclear engineers, because uh, we, we need to face the two to triple the production of energy. Mm. And to do this, we need competence. So we have talent, we need to create new talents, and we have all what we need to do yeah. this and to face, of course, uh, the US will accelerate its strategy and the other continent as well, yeah. but we can play our game. Yeah, yeah. And Francesco, I know that you've studied in the US at MIT, also in the UK and in, in, in France, right, Germany. Mm. What, what, do you, what do you perceive to be the ways in which Europe has an unfair advantage when it comes to fusion? So in magnetic confinement fusion, we have literally our budget of public investment is twice what it is in the United States. So the difference in numbers of people yeah, that are trained in the different. field, it's very obvious to anyone that actually looks at those numbers. The question is, as Europeans, are we able to translate that at this historical time of transition, as you were saying, between the public, public-led research to private-led R&D? Are we able to actually leverage that? Maybe on the point of the Trump administration pushing on nuclear, I think it's also fair to recognize the drive in the US for nuclear is also a little different than the one in Europe. There is, in the US, they just cannot get enough energy. The clean bit is so and so important to, to the current administration, the, the upcoming administration, I would say. But the US has gas. Yeah. And Europe does not have that privilege anymore. Yeah. And so I, would, I think we need to elevate the question, this, the topic of energy, as really calling it for what it is. It's a matter of security for Europe. If we believe that we have a competitive advantage, if we believe that there is enough capital in Europe to fund this clear yeah. moonshots, then the question is why, are we not, why would we not be good enough yeah. at doing this on our soil? There is also the com very competitive advantage of being the only uh, continent able to produce nuclear fuel from the waste, the nuclear waste. Mm. This is absolutely a European, France and Belgium, Competence, mm. and this makes unique this model, mm. and this is a strong, strong element of competitiveness. Yeah, how big do you think the biggest, how big do you think the biggest company in the next generation energy could be? Because Saudi Aramco is a trillion dollar company, right? Yep. Like, what is the largest company in fission today? Do you think it could be bigger than them? No, this is not the aim. Well, Aramco, like Total, like all the big uh, energy company will change their strategy. They sell energy. 
yeah. regardless uh, where they are, it, it is produced. So they are very interested in understanding how does much your does how, well, how cost your uh, does cost your energy. This is the question we have to answer. And if we can demonstrate that our energy will cost something that is completely comparable with renewable, our promise is 60 euro by megawatt, which is quite a competitive price. 16 euro. 60 euro. And uh, this is something that will make happy a lot of, uh, a lot of seller of energy. Yeah, but I think there is the opportunity to turn these new technology companies into something like the Saudi Aramco, as in we are creating, there is a situation of geopolitically positioning technology companies that will become the new Airbus we of Europe. We're looking at markets of effectively infinite size. So we really just have to step up the game and think about the right business model, think about the right partnerships, having the right governments as partners, but then eventually just breaking through and starting to build this stuff. Great. Thank you so much for coming uh, to learn about the future of nuclear in Europe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.